Women Matters session before the summer break. Uh, we are together from how many uh, countries? One, two, three, four, five countries. Five people of five countries, that's good. And of uh, three continents. Yeah, that's, that's a good, good uh, how do you say, a uh, bilancio, a good, uh, uh, I don't know how it is called in English. Anyway, uh, I start, I'm in Italy, it's warm, but not yet really hot. I mean, I heard from Monia that she would say, think that it's really hot here when we have about 34 centigrade. But for us, this is not really hot yet. Hot is 37, 38. So. Today we had only 32, so I have, I'm sitting in the house and my dogs with a big fur, you know, they're... <laughs> yeah, we hear you so that... them. <laughs> <laughs> and later then I will open everything mm -hmm. and then it's nice and cool, so yeah. Um, that's the weather service. Uh, what else? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I had a meeting yesterday on Zoom with uh, four, four people and one person who did the sort of a consulence with us about creating a foundation here in my house and maybe another house uh, and uh, to do some of education that we are thinking about how we could call it the oasis of light maybe or something like this. Uh, um we will see and we are now trying to get the mission statement together and then see how legally it works if we as, as the others are germans uh, and um if it can be in italy or should be it should be in germany or in italy and or if we can also do collaboration with other small foundations so we will see. Anyway, it's about homeschooling, about having uh, people, not only young people, also older people, and do a different way of, of learning and using the fact to be in nature and uh, learning a lot by that. So that's, it's beginning to move and I'm very glad about that. And I give over to Monia. Yeah. Uh... To me, it's hot <laughs> in Vienna, and next week will be, or the next couple of days will be up to 37, 38 degrees, which is just not comfortable anymore for me. So I rather stay inside, and we'll probably cancel a family dinner at lunchtime at the lake uh, because that's just not, yeah, it's not pleasant. And yeah, what happened the last couple of days? We had a quite an interesting uh, talk on our peer group, uh, integral peer group, where there are uh, three women and two men. And the men somehow can't get along anymore. They just heckle all the time and we are getting bored. So last time I moderated and I said, when it came to an end, I said, I'm getting bored with this. Either you do shadow work or you have to think of something else. So now they are into shadow work and they are so different, both of them. So it will be fun. We will have another meeting on the 15th. And if it hasn't worked out until then, the two women, two of the women, because one is on vacation, decided that we assist them in a three to one process. So it's amazing that after so many years, all of, all of a sudden, yeah, uh, it, it looks like they are envious of each other or each has to be the best or the missionary or the leader or, so uh, it's quite a lot different from how women interact. And I'm very glad that the, the other women supported me right away. They said, no, that's not the way to do it. And so we really put a stop to that. And yeah, that was about the most interesting thing that happened. Right now in my apartment, in our apartment, we have a card playing tarot group and I will have to cook 
dinner for them. And but I decided I'd like to be with women for <laughs> for at least an hour. <laughs> and so I pass on to Gertra, no to Haneli. Haneli was after came after me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monja. I did what you are sharing about is music to my ears. One of my passions are learning in a different way and perceiving in a different way. So it's not about so much about systems. It's about the human being and our capacities and human potential. So it's music to my ear. And Monja, also thank you for sharing. I also had some very interesting experiences on Clubhouse. I've been on a Zoom diet, so to speak. Not lots of Zooms, hardly any. But I've spent a little bit of time now and then on Clubhouse. And I've also found that some of the men are really opinionated and trying to just get uh, to justify their opinions and just sitting there and listening to them is always interesting. It's not about judging them, but it's like just very different from, from what we experience here, for example. And um, there's also lots of power struggles as well. And because it's such an open platform where anybody can join, it's really interesting for all these different types of ideas and energies playing around. And then just to be in your own, in your own space while you are being present with whatever is happening in front of you. But I've also experienced lots of synchronicities being on there and lots of surprises, which might help me to get to Europe in some in quicker ways than I originally thought. So and even other parts of the world. So I'm deeply grateful for that. We've had very interesting weather. We had a bout of cold when we last met, really, really cold. And suddenly it's summer. It's really interesting. And I was thinking this morning, it's rather um, daunting because then we might have drought because it's so hot in winter. Because we don't get rain in winter here where I am. Uh, we only get rain in Cape Town in our winters. So it's a little bit, it's wonderful. I love the sun, but it's also having that at the back of the, my mind that if it continues to be this hot in July, we might, our rain might not come early enough for this type of weather. So it does impact everything, but we do enjoy the sun. And I'm passing on to Gertrude. Thank you, Haneli. Um... I spent the weekend in bed, so I'm in recovery mode. Um, and I'm, I'm very much into shadow work <laughs> um, with the emotion code, which I learned in, in spring. So it was like, I had really, I don't know, very, I don't recall my dreams normally, but if I do, they are <laughs> they are really like very vivid, and um, there were some. And calling my homeopath, he, and then he said, "Well, that sounds like some trauma that you need to look at." And so I'm I'm working on that, and and it's really interesting how my whole body, my whole system reacts to that. So, and last weekend I was in, um, in um, near Amsterdam in a, in a wonderful Fenbaude, a wonderful area. So it's wood and in the wood, it, there are some houses and this is a seminar area. And we were there the first evening, we walked for two and a half hours without meeting anybody, not even a car or anything. <laughs> so just, just walking there was so beautiful. And yeah, I'm there. Um, that was one of the, the WeFlow seminars. You remember, <laughs> ACO, yeah. And, what we do so and very deep very very um how can i say that it's it's more about integration than learning something new so i second what you say monia 
intellectually you can be very far <laughs> but then there's something that grabs you by the butt uh, i'm wondering of the emotion code have you ever talked to us about it i don't know i i, I learned it in in spring would be yeah. interesting so if you have it's been yeah. like sharing uh nelson bradley who created it or no. mm -hmm. found it or whatever you call it bradley it bradley mm -hmm. no bradley nelson so bradley nelson <laughs> okay yeah mm -hmm. and um, this is amazing i've really like systematically i go through that uh, it's also in, in German, the, there's a book, Emotions Code, or in English, whatever you prefer. Yeah, he, he's talking about the trapped emotions. So when you have a trauma or something really... Can we first uh, continue with the yeah, second and just... then afterwards, uh, can you maybe... Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. Okay. Sure. Beatrice. It's okay. <laughs> With your new hairdress. <laughs> oh, I just, my hair is oh, getting that's fine. Fine. So it's in a little, <laughs> a little ponytail. Um, let's see. I, so yesterday was 4th of July. So, um, oh yeah, that's true. A lot of, lot of party and <laughs> fun fireworks, beautiful. Um, so I just got up a little while ago, not, I just got up in time for this meeting, actually, I would have stayed in bed probably. Um, um, had a lot of fun yesterday, the fireworks are beautiful, my, my boss, well, the person who I'm co-founding the uh, nonprofit with, uh, he has a rooftop, so he invited me and a few other people to see the fireworks from the rooftop, so that was lovely, and um, see it over the Manhattan <laughs> city line. Um, let's see. So that was the most recent last week of, yeah, I'm just continuing to do all the work that I'm doing. Um, a lot of childcare work. The kids are out of school now. So um, the time that I spent with them, I have to, we, you know, we went to the aquarium and we went to the natural history museum and playing games in the apartment and um, it's a little bit more hands-on though. I, I didn't love the remote school and I didn't love coordinating it, but at least sometimes it gave me a break because <laughs> they were on their Zoom call or whatever. And now, now I, you know, they're hands-on immediate attention the whole time. So that's been fun, but also very exhausting and <laughs> sometimes hard to manage. Um, because the two boys are six and seven and a half and very energetic. Um, and, and slightly rowdy, not so slightly. <laughs> um, but uh, so I've been doing a lot of that, but I've also been getting to do some more social things, which is nice, um, hanging out with friends and going out. Um, and yeah, New York is feeling like it's coming back. Um, and there's some outdoor, I got, I won the lottery for some outdoor tickets to a concert on Wednesday, so I'm excited about that. They're gonna be doing Beethoven and Dvorak. So it's it was free, but to limit the capacity to make sure that it's you know not too crowded, um, they had a lottery system, so you had to sign up. Um, so I don't know who I'm taking to that yet, but I'm excited to go. Um, yeah, I think that's the updates. Um, I might be eating breakfast while I'm on this call. <laughs> And I don't know where my mother is. I texted her, but I guess maybe she's still sleeping because um, it's a lot earlier there. So um, yeah, I think that's my my check-in for now. Okay, if you all agree, let's hear from, from Gertrude what this thing is. Do you? <laughs> Um, that's a system that came to him somehow. Um, he realized that every thing that we encounter as a trauma or maybe even underneath 
what we would call a trauma, but like a some event that, um, and we couldn't deal with the emotion, that this emotion is trapped in a way that's energetically in, in our field, that it's trapped somewhere up to uh, what he calls a heart wall. So a wall around the heart where there are a lot of trapped emotions uh, trapped. <laughs> and um, so there is a system that that he he has he has really like a uh, a chart where said okay this is the column and these are the rows and it's uh, connected to the to the meridians um, so like what trapped emotion could that be and he he's doing it with um, what do you call it kinesiology so to to find out which which emotion is there. And what he found out is that our governance meridian, the, the middle thing, that it's really connected to all the others. And so if, um, and, and he, he found out that with, uh, with magnets and, and our fingertips are magnets as well. <laughs> So you can just stroke over that and release so, those emotions. So, so you, yeah. And, and you have to find out which emotion it is. Maybe you have a pain somewhere and then you ask, is there an emotion trapped related to that pain? And so he had some, yeah. And so I did, did that course with him and yeah, it's a very systematic thing and and it brings me to the like there are so many things in my life that happened and I just brushed over it because I had to and then going back and systematically going through that and now with a dream going back and say oh that happened as well so I I, I just talk about uh, one day, um, my eldest, when she was just a toddler, somehow she climbed up and and we I found her. She was outside the window on the on the window seal on the and was looking for a auto auto. <laughs> And I couldn't reach her because, I mean, there was this where you can open it and then there was a part where you couldn't open it. And and then uh, my now husband, he was there and and then he said, talk to her. And so I talked to her no, <laughs> very nicely. And so he, he just came very quietly and grabbed her. And yeah, so yeah all the guilt in third floor i mean she would have not survived it and and so but i didn't think of it that anymore but with fever and so all, this came up as a dream and it was i couldn't see it it was her but i could the situation was exactly the same and she tipped over and just grabbed the foot and so yeah, there was this trapped emotion of guilt. How how could she even come there? And 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 that shock and whatever. So yeah, and and to release that, it was really good. To, yeah. So things like that. And and there are some like when you have symptoms or you have a specific event like that and go there and say, okay, what trapped emotions are there? And I'm doing it with friends now with a heart wall, not right, to remove all the trapped emotions uh, around the heart, which help you um, or um, how, um, yeah, they, I mean, this is between you and and another person. So, so if you have a heart, well, relationships are impeded, 
And so to remove that, that's really a wonderful thing. And you you can see the difference in people. And how do you remove the heart wall? Well, one by one. So, so you have to take one emotion at a time. Mm -hmm. So it takes some time. He says most people when they are adults and it, uh, they have about 350 emotions trapped. And if there are some more things happening, of course, you can add to that. But uh, he says, so one, one a day, so you after a year, you're pretty free. So I think I have some more. <laughs> yeah, so this, this is really, and you, you detect the, the emotion and then you stroke over your meridian and release it. So, but uh, yeah, that's, um, for short. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's yeah. quite interesting. I looked up the book in the meantime. And yeah. So. Yeah. And, and in the book, there is also the chart. Yeah. And, yeah. I can just not do it and, and get money for it. So I have to do the training, but uh, I learned it for myself and for friends and family. And that's it. Thank you Gita, for reminding me of that. Because we've used this as well uh, four years ago. I was connecting with a Spanish group every week. And before we started, we worked, we also through kinesiology, we um, were tapping into which emotions do we, is standing in our way to work together as a group. Mm -hmm. It was the collective emotions, not individual, but we used his work. I've got his book as well. Yeah, and I, I really liked it. It was like, Okay, <laughs> I use it right away and I did a, a chart in an Excel sheet to to find the yeah. And it's also for um for inherited emotions. Or when you get other people's emotions, like at my birth, which was really tough. Um, I was very astonished to get the emotions of helplessness from the midwife. Hmm. So, so that others infused my, my feeling. So, and I was very happy to release all that. <laughs> yeah. how, do you, oh, sorry. how do you detect for example, the emotion of helplessness of the midwife. How do you detect it? You have that chart and the oh. chart is, you, you just go and say, is it column A or is it column B? And then said, yeah, the odd rows, the, <laughs> the even rows. And then you ask, oh, so you're waiting. So you don't and... throw darts at the chart. No, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you, you really do it systematically. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how, how far is it different from Vivian Dittmer's emotional backpack? I'm not so, so I, I mean, I, I saw her um, video from, from the IC and so I'm, I'm very much, so what she's talking about, but I'm not so into her work that I know exactly what she's doing and how she's doing it. So I don't know. He, he's, he, he got it some 30 years ago. So it's, it's around for some time. And um, what I, I really like that guy. He's, he's very um, like, when you see the videos, he's so the way he's he's presenting it. I, I really like that, and it makes so much sense. And when I get the emotions, I've yeah, <laughs> this was attached to that. 
yeah, for example, horror or fear with that, what I was talking about, or guilt, things like that. So. What is uh, your perceived benefit now? What is now different when you do this work uh, to, to before you did that? Uh, my tooth is better, <laughs> like right away today. So I, I have this, and, and he said, this is not, I mean, this is nothing for the dentist. It's really like some old stuff to be released. And, and I can feel that my whole system is better. And there is some lightness coming in. And for me, it was very like touching. He says 90% of the people have heart walls. That's just the way it is. And to get that I don't have any, it was really like, yeah, I tested several times and and to feel that somehow I, I managed to, to keep my heart open. So that was really nice. Yeah, and to, to be thorough, you know, really to go through all the events in my life and to go all through all the systems, even if it's just a little finger that's like arthritis. Just yeah, to be thorough. And at first you thought it's it's crazy. I mean, you stroke <laughs> over your head and it's done, but I I can feel the difference. I wanted to ask Monia, you have said already years ago about the heart opening. Uh, I wonder how you perceived it or perceive it when 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 do we or do everybody of us perceive that we have an open heart and how do we notice that we have this heart wall? Question for both, for everyone. I also Beatrice, when you have a mouth uh, open, uh, empty, uh, something like that. <laughs> Guten Appetit, Beatrice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having, um, I'm eating oats the way my father used to make them. We put them in milk overnight in the fridge with dried fruit or grated apple or something like that. Anyway, I mean, I think I was listening to this even when you brought it up at the beginning. I, uh, when I was, I don't know, six, maybe younger, somewhere, somewhere, or maybe seven. Um, no, I guess we were already in Japan, maybe it was eight. I don't know, somewhere in that, that age range. Um, my father was having some health problems and we were in Germany at the time and we went to see a, um, doctor, a, a holistic doctor um, who did you know pendulum swings and all these things that and I think my mother and I were kind of weren't sure <laughs> how convinced we were about it all, but um, but my father really you know wanted to go to this doctor and and so then after the doctor checked out my father, um, he said, "Well, let me check both of you out too," you know, even though it wasn't part of the appointment, but we were there, and he said that I had gestaut de wut, which. Okay. Um, yeah, for Hanali, it's a, a like stored up. Voot is is translates to rage. rage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not it's not it's not anger. It's like rage. And so he said that I had stored up rage. And my mother and I 
didn't understand at all because you know I was a very happy child I was very social I was you know this just wasn't something but it's something that my whole life I've thought about and my mother has thought about and we've tried to you know understand what that was about and if it was true and and sometimes I feel like it is true I mean I've definitely had moments where I, the, it just kind of something boils up in me that I don't even know is there um I don't know. So I think it's interesting, the trapped, the trapped emotion idea. I think it's true. I think, I think a lot of, there's a lot of things that we go through that we have to be strong and push forward. And, you know, in the moment can't take time to process the emotions because it's a matter of survival or it's a matter of coping or it's a matter of being professional or whatever. I know I do that a lot. I've done that with every loss that I've had. Um, yeah. And then if you don't, if you don't release it, it just, yeah, it does. I think it piles up. I don't know. I think I never heard of, I'd never heard of this particular method of releasing, but I think it's interesting. And I think, I don't know, I get stomach aches all the time, especially when I'm feeling stressed out or, or something emotional is coming up. It's, it usually comes to my lower abdomen. that could be a possibility to say, okay, I mean, you can say, do I have trapped emotions? Of course I do somewhere, <laughs> but it's it's a lot easier or more specific if you say, okay, stomach ache, <laughs> is there any trapped emotions that is related to the stomach ache? few years back, I'm, because I've also had <clears throat> this, this type of stored up rage in me that I felt as a young girl. And uh, I had many reasons for it because of what happened in my environment. You know, things I witnessed that other people most probably never witnessed in their lives, like real horror-like events. So I was at some, on some level I knew I was angry at how can humans do these things to each other? Um, but what started happening with me, because you're going, like you said, we go into coping mode and you just go on, you just go on. And then what started happening with me, I think it was about 10, 12 years ago, my soul would put me in positions where I have to express my emotions, where I have to really intensely feel it, which otherwise I wouldn't do it. I would just go on. So it still happens, but it's not in that intensity. At that time, it was really, really intense. It, some things will just happen around me that I would normally never react to, but my soul decided, this is it, you, let's see what you do now, so just to express those. And I've, did some, I've done some very interesting things at the time. And if, if I really think back at, it was, it was a surrendering as well. It's not, it's allowing yourself to feel it, whatever it might be. So it, well, I wasn't used to something like this here um, at the time, but it was expressing and I could feel it in my body. So I need to go back to your question of when do you know your heart's open or not? I feel it in my heart, like physically. I have a sensation. I feel a heart energy. Then I know my heart's open. And so from a sensory level, on, I don't know how it happened, but I do know exactly when there's a wall. I can feel it. So I be, but I feel it before I become cognizant of it. And... Um, I thank you for bringing it up again because so incidentally, the young, the Spanish people that I knew, but we, but we didn't do the, this thing. We were just using the emo, his emotional code to work with before we came into our sessions. And incidentally, after two years, one of the Spanish young people connected with me today. <laughs> so and you're just bringing it up again. So there's obviously a reason why I have to look at it as well. But the trauma, I do know that I still carry lots of trauma in my body, um, stored in my cells in some levels. And also the surrogation thing. When my dad passed, and he passed in my arms when I was 17, his energy took mine over. So I surrogated his energy for 33 years before I discovered it. And then I was really angry. And I discovered it in the States actually when I was um, 
learning about integral and spiral dynamics and the likes and energy. And when I returned after a month, my, nobody recognized me. But I was able to, on an energetic level, work with that rage because I was so angry at him that he took, that I surrog that he took over my energy, that I surrogated his. Um, and I had to express that, but I was able to use that system to physically release that anger. So I think that helped me a lot to also process some of the other stored um, trapped uh, emotions that was in my body as well. Because it was really intense. It was really working with the core primal energies and to go into that place where you really feel it all over your body, which I do know today it's a gift because it helped me to open up that I can be so sensory. But it is something that we sometimes don't really give lots of attention to. And I'm glad that we can, you know, with the younger we are, that we can then start working on it. We don't have to wait till we're our age and then suddenly have to work on all these things because it does rob us from our inner peace and our inner joy on some level. Thank you, I'm complete. I did a ther um, body therapy training when I was in my 30s. Um, and this was a lot of, you know, <laughs> um, emotions coming up. And so, and, and I think that's, but you, you don't have to go through all that was in order to release it. And that's, that's what I really like. So to, to like be present of what that was and then release it without going through the same thing again so that sometimes you have to but uh, but i like i like to to yeah really get it and then release it without the drama attached. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, Anneli, I'm a little confused. <laughs> uh, could you elaborate on the surrogation of energy? I've never heard that before. It's when, yeah, it's, it's actually, it happens quite often and people are completely unaware of it. Let me explain what happened to me that will give you an idea how, how you could physically see it in my body. So like I said, I was 17, I was rather slim at the time. And suddenly my body shape changed, like, like of a man. I couldn't go to the gym anymore. I used to go to the gym twice a day. And I couldn't go to the gym anymore and do any, like, you know, with any um, weight training. I couldn't do any of those because my shoulders got this big. So my body shape changed, but I never knew why. I couldn't understand why. And my masculine energy was so strong. I was, throughout my whole marriage, I was the provider. And after I ended my marriage, I also chose, before I saw the pattern, it was my masculine was so strong. I was always looking at weaker men that I could play that role. But it wasn't me because it wasn't inherently me. And you could also see it in my face as well. You could see it anywhere. So when I was on that energy training where I, where I, like I said, when I was learning about spiral and integral and all those things as well, and, you know, and we, were, we were working intensively also with the I Ching and the likes, but it was then when the person who was bringing that modality into the world noticed when we were working with primal energies and he didn't know anything about my dad, or my history, and he walked over while we were working with primal energies and he, with me and a young girl for another woman from Canada. And he tipped me on the shoulders and he said, he asked me, is your dad's name Daniel? And I just froze because I don't know, how did he know that? You know? And, he, and then he said to me, are you aware that you're not carrying your own energy? That you're surrogating his energy for whatever reason. He didn't know my dad passed at that time or that he was still not alive, that he wasn't alive anymore. He only, he only picked that up intuitively when he was, because we were working with these primal energies, he, he could see there was a foreign energy in my energy field. And 
Then he said to me, I can now choose if I want to, because I can, I'm now like a newborn baby. And the woman who worked with me on that in, the, in that specific exercise, she said my eyes looked like a newborn suddenly. It was something, a complete change because I made the decision, I don't want to carry this energy anymore, surrogate it anymore. And, but then my body went into excruciating pain for three, four days for that energy to release. And obviously he showed me what to do to make it less painful, but it was extreme pain because my body, it was so entrenched in my cells. And I wanted this foreign energy out regardless of whether it was my dad's or not. But in that same training, we also learned how to surrogate somebody's energy um, on their behalf consciously, but you don't take it on. Um, but it's not something new. It happens with a lot of people. But like I said, when I came back to South Africa, nobody recognized me. They said, who are you? Because I, I look different. My body shape started changing back to more like feminine. And although I carried this intense rage still at the time, because I was so angry at him, but I could feel something dramatically happened in my body. Um, and I also contribute that today that my sensory abilities are linked to that as well, because I went through that process of really deeply feeling whatever it was on so many different levels, but also releasing that energy out of my system. I know it sounds weird for people, but I'm a physical example of it. And I could feel something was completely different. And for a very long time after that, because he said you are in a very, you are blessed to be in such a position because you can now choose what and who you want to be from a physicality point of view and energetic level. You're like a really newborn. And the woman I worked with in that exercise, her, both her sons were born through cesareans. And she always wished she could look into the eyes of a newborn because she couldn't do it with her own children. And she said, I gave her the gift that day that she could see a newborn's eyes. Because she said, there was a complete shift. The moment he told me, she was watching this now. She was observing this without knowing what was really going on. And she just said, it was like a miracle. And then the process after that, when I came back to release the anger, um, but also to now, who are you? <laughs> you can now live your life like you wanted to. And if you go and look at my story, it really makes sense as well, that I wasn't living my own life. It was completely not my own life. Do you and know I, what emotions you took because over? Because I was so, um, no, it wasn't these emotions that took over. He took over my energy. So it was yes. energy mm -hmm. took over mine. But what was, uh, and afterwards I discovered from my own healing process that for some, whatever reason it was, you know, I most probably had a, some, some type of contract with him, soul contract, I don't know. So I was not a victim. I had to go to the level that I wasn't a victim in this to be really free of it. Because if I went into victim state, it would have, it would have, that, that energetic hold would have still be over me. So it was a very long journey to after that to really come to my core energy and to know this is me. It's not a foreign, it's not a foreign energy. But in that training, we learned, we learned how to surrogate on behalf of other people. If somebody's, for example, very ill and or they're struggling. But it's a conscientious thing. They would be, you know, they would be uh, approval from both parties to do that. And I, when I notice it with other people in the train, I didn't do it in the training because of this experience. But some of the other people did go through that to see what it feels like when you surrogate somebody else's energy. And also the one um, proving for that somebody can do it on your behalf. So there's a lot of healing in that because you're watching it. So you don't have to go, maybe the trauma was too big for you to go through. You just can't process it, but then you can watch it. So there was a lot of healing for others in that as well. But it's not something that I would, I've never after that, even because of my own experience, even tried something like that. I never wanted to, but it was just not for me. Um, the purpose of it was, there is a sacred purpose around it. If you do surrogate it consciously, but for me, it wasn't part of my path. 
but it's part of my bigger story. So I, I, I had to, I do believe that for whatever reason I had to go through it and, to, and also discover it 33 years later and to become free of it and to come really into my own energy. But I had to, and he said, if I didn't go to that primal energy with which we were working with, I wouldn't have been able to, nobody would have been able to notice it. Because my, you, you talk about the, these walls, these are these layers, was too ingrained. Mm. I had to a deep, deep primal energy of myself for somebody else to witness, but something is wrong here. This is not her energy. But it was fascinating how my body changed. Everything changed. It was really incredible. It was like a miracle. But I remember like after he died, suddenly my whole life was upside down. I had horrible dreams. I had lots of trauma when he passed, lots of trauma, unlike my siblings at the time. And it wasn't my mom couldn't understand it at the time either. So I had anger towards her as well because she didn't understand what I was going through. But nobody did really, can't blame them because it was something out of the ordinary. Sounds like possession, that you were possessed. Yeah, yeah it was, it, you, you can call it possession, but it's energetic hold. So it's energetic hold. Uh, and that's why my whole body changed everything. So I, it, was, it's a, it, it was very interesting um, how it happened. But your father didn't have any special power or did he? No, we, we were all, he's, he's part of the family, we were all psychic. Oh. Very, um, a very aware of, of the unseen world oh. and feel it and they could tell the most beautiful stories but it wasn't it wasn't devious you know there wasn't it wasn't I didn't feel it although I was very angry at him I didn't feel it was um, although I felt he robbed me of my life he didn't feel I don't even like to use those type of words but it didn't feel devious you know it didn't feel whatever reason it happened, how it happened, I, I, I don't know. Maybe I was in such, in such a shock that he was trying to hang on to my life energy, that he wasn't ready, because he was still very young, that he wasn't ready to go. I don't know. And there I was, and I was 17, and he was 53. And it was very interesting what happened many, many years after that, because after that experience in the States, I had an invitation from a friend to go to a dream dancing, to go to now just speak about dance, about dreaming, to a dream dancing uh, workshop. And all I saw was dancing. I didn't read anything. Because I'm a dancer, I thought, oh, this is going to be wonderful. And it was a, a man from the US, I still can't even remember his name, but he was teaching people how to connect with those who have passed. And when I walked into the workshop, I saw a lot of old people crying and I thought, what's going on here? I thought it's a dancing workshop and he's sitting in front with his guitar and I walk straight to the front so I can literally touch him. And I'm looking around and the people crying and he must probably read my mind and he said, no, you're in the right place. And I'm like, no, I'm not in the right place. I came to dance, what's going on here? And he said, just wait, just you're here for a purpose, just wait. So when he, he, told, he showed us a dream process how to connect with those who have passed. So he taught us that. But what happened was Anneli was completely resistant. I don't want to speak to dead people. <laughs> I know I, did. I, I don't want to do it. And he asked us to call up somebody who has passed, just into our awareness, through the process now, through the dreaming process, which is really very simple. And I didn't want to, and he, he touched me and he said, Call up your dad. And again, I was like shocked. <laughs> See, I don't want to speak to my dad. I'm still very angry at him. And there was my dad. And suddenly I could have that ability. And then I could express my anger to him. <laughs> was, what did you do to me? Why did you do this? But it was uh, very interesting. I just, it was literally a year after that incident happened in the States that I went to this dream dancing workshop. And they call it dancing because it's really a beautiful process. It's like dancing. And um, there's nothing weird about it either. But it was just very interesting that I had opportunities to express some of this anger to him directly. To say, hey, what have you done to me? But yes, thank you. I'm complete. I'm taking up all the time here. <laughs>
This is perfectly fine. I find it so interesting. I've never heard about these things, so. I know. Really. I'm still trying to piece it together. <laughs> it's, yeah, this is what I only know from the Catholic Church uh, possessed by a demon or, or uh, but to be it's, possessed by your own father. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's not, it's not the same, you know, from, a, from a, the unseen world and from on an energetic and psychic level, it's different. Hmm. Because my body changed. Um, you know, it's not that somebody possesses you and you just act out weird or whatever it might be. I don't know. I, don't, I never believe, you know, I never had that belief system like in the Catholic Church, something like that happening. This was very different because it was, it's so subtle. You know, it, it happened so subtly. You know, I didn't start acting out like a weird person. My body started changing and I started going deep into my masculine energy at the time, which there were no reason for. Because I didn't do any personal development work at the time, I was so young. But I do know that two years of my life, I was completely spaced out after that happened. I don't know how I passed matric. I don't know how I passed my first university year because I was just not present. I wasn't, I wasn't, I could, all those things add up. Something happened to me because I wasn't present. I had no memories of that time much, not a lot of memories of that two years um, after he passed. So it all made sense that something happened to me on some level. But I didn't ever feel it as afterwards, even when I was made aware of it. I didn't feel it as like, you know, like, like possession, like of a demon. No, not like that at all. It wasn't, a, but it, because I studied the energy, because I experienced the energy physically, I could understand what happened from an energetic level. And then it, its impact on my life. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Beatrice, when you hear things like that, um, what, what, what is the, the um, impact on you? I want to put it in context. I'm listening to Richard Rohr, Upwards, something like this. I've forgotten the, his Falling book. Upwards. Falling Upwards, yeah. And when he talks about the first, well, yeah. mm -hmm. the first part of life where you have certain tasks and the second part of life, and you are definitely in the first part of life and we are definitely in the second part of life and so i'm wondering how this uh, lands with you and i need to say that the second par part of life is more in looking into the spiritual uh, um, part and less into the i want to create career and things like that so question to you you need to unmute <laughs> um I don't know. I'm taking it all in like Manya. Um, I, before, before you started sharing all of that, I was thinking about when, when you were talking about the heart open and I was going to say that I am kind of afraid of that, of the heart open um, because of, and I think it's a different thing than what you're talking about, but it's similar in that of absorbing too much. I feel like I already absorb a lot um and i yeah i'm afraid of soaking up other people's energy or energy around that is not mine um and getting kind of lost in that and losing my sense i mean i think maybe this answers your question heidi about right this time in my life feels very much about unveiling who i am or kind of peeling back layers and investigating and understanding and trying to and building. I think some of it's some of it's investigatory, you know, that it's it's things that are already there at a core that maybe have always been there, but I didn't know how to identify or see. And then there's other things that maybe I can choose to, you know, add as I move forward, what kind of person I want to be. Um, yeah, but it's <laughs> the idea of being able to absorb someone's energy like that. That's that's very scary to me. 
Um, and even on the, on the, you know, minute level, like just, it's, it's the reason why I've thought, I've thought a lot about, you know, I, I got my undergraduate degree in psychology and I mean, outside of the artistic practice, I've thought a lot about becoming a psychologist or a therapist or counselor or something like that as, as a possible career path. But then I think the reasons that I haven't pursued that is I think even just in regular life, I tend to take on <laughs> people's feelings. And I'm also not, I think, sorting out my own feelings enough. I think I have a lot of the stored up, not stored up, trapped emotions that Greg Chad was talking about. Um, so ultimately I haven't pursued that because I, I don't, I know, and I know there's techniques of like how to be present and not, you know, there's all of that, but um, it feels, it feels overwhelming a little bit. Um, yeah. When is, when does the first half shift to the second half? <laughs> how many more years of this nonsense do I have to deal with? <laughs> he says uh, from 35 on, but I mean, it's, I think it's different in, in, in every, between 35 and 55, you should make the shift more or less. So <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> still ex experience got a little bit. I've got some time. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, my birthday is in two weeks. Um, I will be turning 29. Oh. <laughs> But um, but I, I even I've I've heard from a lot of people. I mean, even just people that are like slightly older, you know, in their thirties, that they feel like their thirties were when they started to really feel grounded, and that the twenties were kind of all over the place. So I'm curious to see what my experience is and what shifts as I enter shortly in a year, enter a new decade. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Those are my <laughs> immediate thoughts, but well, I think. Oh, sorry, Monia, go I'm, ahead. I'm wondering um, about the responsibility you have, how your energy, uh, how your energy works on other people. This is something you really. This is something I have been uh, training now because sometimes you're not aware even how much uh, you influence them or how much of your energy goes to them. And to be aware of that, I think it's a responsibility of the second half of life. So in my opinion, um, but I'm still, uh, I still have to think about because I was there when my father died and I saw the light in him rising in his eyes and he sh shone. So that was so different from what you said. It's it's uh, so pre maybe it's a comic, a comic condition. That's the only thing I really can think about. But that night, what you're sharing now is really. Uh, I've also been with others who have passed. Now I had a completely different experience of what I of what I observed. And the night when he passed, I was studying, and. I saw, I, I could, I saw something, and I call it black now because I didn't have any other way of expressing it, coming behind me through the hallway to my parents' bedroom because they were already sleeping. They had three heart attacks. My mom ran to call the doctor and I went in and I was holding him and then he passed after the third one. But I saw something, so I was aware of something. That's all I remember because I was in such deep shock. But I've been present with others who passed and I had also a completely different experience, a completely different experience if I now, but I can't remember much of what happened that night because it, it was very traumatic uh, because I tried to uh, revive him and I couldn't because I was too small to make any difference on his chest. Um, and my mom lost it, she didn't know what to do. But I had a very different experience than you also uh, with others who have passed. So. Um, but it's part of my story of immortality, of totality, of living totally and not being afraid of death. It's just part of my own life story of not being afraid of death. And, and to, to uncover why not, why I shouldn't be afraid of myself in my own way. 
But Beatrice, don't worry. Your life is beautiful and don't let these type of talk upset you. But I understand what you're saying about, you know, and also what you said sharing more now about, I think it's a level of awareness we get to of being aware of our impact on other people's energy. But at your, you know, there's another way of, the sh in the shamanic, um, especially in the women's of shamanism, they, call, they talk about your three, your three fates. So your first one is around about where you are now, so your first fate. Then you go into your second one, and then in your 60s, 60s I think you're going to your third one. Um, but each has a different purpose. And again, it's not time driven, you know, uh, totally agree as well. It's not for all the same, you know, but it, they, people can notice there was a shift in their lives at those times, even if they were not aware of consciously making a shift, you know, or doing something, create a shift. But about the taking on of energies, um, just for intention by itself, one can create a boundary that we don't soak up other people's energies because that are on very different levels. It's not only, it's not only energetic, it's emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and it happens on many different levels. Um, but it's not something to keep you, hold you back from living your life. Please don't do that. Just live your life <laughs> and enjoy every moment. Well, it's interesting because I've, um... Uh, for a couple of weeks, this hasn't been true because he was on vacation, but I was seeing, um, and I'm going to see him again today, uh, he calls himself an intuitive body worker. He does Reiki and massage, and I might have mentioned him once before, but he does, that's kind of a combination of different techniques that he's, you know, integrated together, um, and his sessions are two hours usually, and um, I don't know. I've I've felt it's. It, I guess what I'm getting at is I'm thinking about how the how how interconnected the body is with the spirit and the energy and the soul and everything else. You know the emotions, because I've had. I don't know. There've been weeks where I've gone to him and I didn't even think I had a hard week or was caring very much. But by the end, when I got up and I felt so much lighter and so so much more open and that heart opening feeling and everything that. I felt totally shifted as a person in space um, because he's released all these things I didn't even know I was holding. Um, and, but one of the things, cause he's often does work like work right here. And this is often very tight for me. And once he said to me, he said, you know, you don't have to wear, he called it Roman armor. He says, you've got Roman armor. <laughs> you don't have to wear the roman armor he said he said you can have you can just have a, a membrane a heart membrane that still protects you and, and you're still grounded but you don't have to you know <laughs> enclose it um anyway so everything that we're talking about today reminds reminded me of that that he said that and today i'm seeing him again he was on vacation for a few weeks i'm excited to go back i was going every week for a few weeks there and it's very helpful to try to be more present and not hold hold on to as much even just on a weekly basis of what's going on but also releasing things from the past I mean and um there was one day that I felt that my father showed up that he was there with me it was very brief and Paul was just he was just like doing something on my hand it was something very simple like nothing was happening I was lying there and he was doing something to my hand and then my father was there and just with me um and then he left and you know moved on to something else but it's I don't know I think it's it's amazing what yeah what our physical bodies hold in terms of that energetic connection and connection beyond beyond the like maybe even tangible here and now yeah, a salt bath <laughs> is also good to have like marine salt and take a bath with it to just release some of that stuff. And um, I think what your friend said about the, the armor, I, I, that resonates very much with me. Um, 
when you said I need the armor to protect myself from that, I don't think that happens. I, I think you still can take on. So it's it's more like um, if if you are lighter and you are have more that membrane than an armor, you can distinguish better and you can so you're more free to take in what you want and leave out what you don't. So when you're, let's say aura, when when that's like doesn't have holes anymore, but it's it's kind of a yeah, only with invitation. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't think that the party. <laughs> pun? Yeah. Oh, I just said exclusive invitation only. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't think that the heart armor really protects you. It's just the, the uh, yeah, the illusion. So when you have that, when you have that trauma, whatever that is, that and ongoing uh, to to have that maybe twenty emotions in your heart wall, um, then you're still vulnerable. You're still so, but but you don't feel it anymore. You you just the pain isn't that hard anymore till something happens where it gets broken up like like Hanili was sharing but i don't think that this is helping to to prevent what you are afraid of that's what i think so you just the membrane is better than the than the wall <laughs> you just mentioned something that could be another topic uh, holes in the aura Mending the aura, or, or how do you fill the holes, or how do you, and not not today, but uh, this is yeah, something yeah. I'm writing down, so maybe this would interest me too that you have holes in your aura. It's I never heard that before. The whole concept of aura we could discuss, mm -hmm. but at this point, I, I would say that we have holidays until the beginning of uh, yeah. September, yeah. And we, uh, I write an email, but we can al already say the first uh, Tuesday in September, we can. Which is, no, Monday, we, we are Mondays. Yeah. It's the 6th. The 6th the is the first Monday in September. Okay. Mm -hmm. Women matters. Good. At this okay. point, I close the recording.